Hello, Roger. I'm Hi, reading you first. And hello to everybody who's watching us today. We are so happy that you are with us. Um, you know, so much has been going on as we watch TV. But Roger, I got to share something with you. And sure. it, yeah, it ties in with what you're going to be talking about today. But it has to do with my quiet time, my devotional. And the Lord had told me months ago to uh, read the first book of each covenant and put them together. And a lot of times, you know, it's not very much. I mean, sometimes it's two, three verses. Sometimes it's 10 verses. Uh, it's whatever, wherever God has told me to begin and start with. Okay. And so I was at, was at the place yesterday where uh, Abraham is having to put together an army in order to go rescue his nephew Lot. Oh, yeah. And I, I don't want to go into detail about that, but the scripture that goes with that in Matthew was the story of the centurion when he wanted his daughter healed. And he goes to Jesus and asking for healing. And Jesus says, well, yeah, I'll come to your house. And he says, no, it's not necessary. And I'm a man under authority. And I go where I say, you know, you get tell them to do this. And they do it. And I was comparing that to Abraham because Abraham also was a man under authority who had people under him because he had taken and discipled, raised up the, his servants. There's 318 of them and he could command them. And when you look at the battle plan in scripture there, they knew what to do. And they were going up against four kings. And it, it just really struck me because, you know, as we've been talking about this armor, here's this centurion soldier having all these men under him. I think it's like a thousand. And he's dressed in this armor. But the most important thing that he had was his authority. And, mm. and so, Roger, I thought it, we needed to address this issue of authority. And I happened, since I am on the inside, I happen to know that we're talking about authority today anyway. So why don't you pick up there and elaborate on this? Okay. Yeah, be, be happy to. You know, the uh, situation with Abraham is a really such an interesting story. Oh, it's you know, here, fascinating. You know, here's a guy that comes out of a pagan, pagan land, pagan culture. You know, uh, I think somebody said that the, family business was making idols yeah know? they were they were mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah right yeah. you know and and so we go from that to you know god singling him out and and uh, ultimately god says i'm gonna make a great nation out of you i know it. <laughs> yeah. is that amazing and it's like what wait how did that happen you know <laughs> yeah. yeah and the other thing when i was studying this too it really struck me because you know, scripture causes this portion for the first time, as far as I can tell, it says, Abraham, Abram, okay, my, he, come on, what's the word? Uh, he is a Hebrew, okay? And it's the very first time. And that word means to pass over. And I say, God, what is it that you changed his name that you specified that where you didn't call him a Canaanite any longer? Because that's mm -hmm. where the people from Ur were Canaanites. And that. And now he's changed his whole nationality. And I began thinking about why. And I began thinking about the other incidences that scripture gives. And it shows how selfish he was. You know, <laughs> how self-centered he was. And it was all about him. You know, and what <laughs> he wanted. And now there's his nephew. And now he's thinking about somebody else. And how in the world to save him. So he's lost that self-centeredness. So he's passed over from being one way. He's mm. beginning to grow in the Lord mm -hmm. into a different position. And I think that's what happens to us when we begin to exercise God's authority because we begin to grow a little bit in it. Right. The uh, interesting thing about that, when God changed his name, he added the H-A sound yes. to it which is the sound of God's name, Yah. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, that hasn't uh, happened yet at this point in the story, but right. it does later. 
And so, yeah, so Abram becomes Abraham, which shows the union between him and God. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and of course, that's, that's how he becomes a great nation and Israel comes into being and right. the whole world. We don't, don't even need to get into all the kind of, sidetracked the sidetrack yeah. because yeah, because that, that, uh, gets into the very skirmishes that's going on today between the, oh, between doesn't the, it? the cousins, we'll call them the cousins, you know, yeah, the yeah. son of Ishmael and the son of Isaac. Oh, but, I began counting the nations that aligned with Abraham to go rescue Lot versus the nations that were all aligned around Sodom that, you know, that took Lot, those kings. Uh, there's such a huge parallel. But the good news is that Abraham won against great odds. And yes. we as believers, because of the authority of Jesus in our lives, we win a great, against great odds. <laughs> yes, we do. That's, that's so true. So like um, uh, Abraham, you know, I don't know. I have no idea. The scripture doesn't really record where Abraham got his military training. But, no, it doesn't. You know, but he was able to train those 300 and some servants, you know. That was, uh, I think that was the original. They had that movie called 300, you know. Oh, really? I think, yeah, I never saw that. There's a movie no. out there called 300, and it's it's not based on the Bible, but it, it's based on a very small group of men taking on a huge, mm -hmm. you know, huge We see that theme yeah. over and over a couple of times. We talked with Gideon and his army of 300. We have Abraham with his army of 300. 318, yeah. yeah and, and Roger, Roger. Not, on, not only that, but his ability to plan the battle. I mean, he divided them into two different sections when they came against all those kings. He just didn't march in. I mean, right. they went in at night and the two and how he had it coordinated so they'd strike at the same time. Scripture doesn't tell us that. Neither does right. it tell us how they were dressed. <laughs> you know, it doesn't say they're dressed in Roman warfare because that was the no. days of Rome. Right, right, right. The interesting thing about it is, though, that he demonstrated a knowledge of war. Yes, you know, he did. And, uh, and a knowledge of battle in, uh, without any history, you know, knowing where he might have picked it up. I have to assume that that he just simply was being obedient to God, which is what he you know, he goes out of a pagan land because God speaks to him and says, rise up and go to this land I'm going to send to you. And mm -hmm. it's like, uh, okay, you know, um, you're looking around, are you speaking to me? You know, kind <laughs> of thing. And it's like, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. It's like, hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And, and the other amazing so, thing, he did. I was going to say, so he yeah, had this ability. Ahead. He had this ability to be able mm -hmm. to hear the voice of God and to recognize it for what it was. Yeah. And no fear. And no it, fear. He wasn't afraid to leave. The one time you do see some fear was taking his wife down into Egypt, you yeah. know. Oh, they're yeah. going to steal my wife. You know? Yeah. yeah. yeah we... That's where he saw his faith falter like that. So it became all about him to preserve my life. Yeah, we but... won't get into that story either. No, <laughs> no, no, no. But I just couldn't help bring this up between the two men of that tremendous authority that they each had and the similarity. They were both fighters. I mean, and then who we are in Christ, we need to know our authority. It's a perfect, you know, relationship there. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so yeah, so like you said, that's a really good lead in <laughs> to where we're going because, yeah, most of us that come to Jesus, um, you know, we're first of all, we're not even, we're vaguely aware maybe that we're in a battle, in a war. Vaguely, if that you know, at all. Uh, you know, our sum total might be when we were kids and we saw cartoons and they showed the devil sitting on one shoulder. And the angel sitting on the other shoulder. Right. You know? I remember those cartoons. 
Yeah. yeah. And the devil's trying to, you know, convince him to do bad and the angel's trying to convince him to to do good, you know. And, There's uh, a good uh series on Netflix right now. This illustrates what we're talking about, uh calling called The Everlasting Law. And it's the stories of these two angels that come to earth who are to be lawyers. And they're up against the uh fallen angel, which of course is Satan. And so you see some of this here. So it's a kind of an interesting series. That's, that's I just the, wrote that down. Yeah. I mean, yeah, <laughs> we've only watched the first one. I mean, I have. Rex started it and fell asleep. So, but uh, it gives you something to think about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, so what we want to talk about here is like Abraham, God spoke to him and somewhere along the line, God was able to communicate to him, particularly when it came to the battle for his nephew, Lot. Um, you know, God was able to communicate to him some war, obviously some war strategies. And, uh, and I can't help but think that maybe he had some angels, some help from the angels as well. Mm -hmm. Talking about that, the Bible, that's just my speculation. The Bible doesn't really say that. I you know. suspect that too, because scripture talks about uh, how the captain of the host, which is the captain of the God's armies, which we know mm -hmm. are angels. Um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I definitely believe that. Yeah. So, in order for us to really grasp, you know, we've, we've been talking about how God has given us these weapons of war, you know, and, and we've talked about, um, we've talked about our relationship with the Lord and how to, um, to be, to listen and obey and be obedient. But I think that one of the things that we haven't really uh dug into very much is like the you mentioned the centurion soldier and that is where he understood jesus had authority and and he got that understanding because he was a centurion i don't know what rank that actually is but sounds like maybe a captain or a major or something what we would call today not really sure i'd have to look that up but um, yeah, I don't know. I do know yeah. they say that they are over like a thousand men. But um, so he understood how how authority flowed. And he also I think he probably also understood that that um, uh, because he seemed to be a humble person, not a man that was, um, you know, given over to uh, braggarty, braggarty, you know, conduct or anything like that he seemed he seemed very humble and and uh which told me that he had this sense of okay yeah i have this authority but he understood that it wasn't him personally that that authority for him came from rome and mm -hmm. and he was able to see what jesus was he could heal the sick and and um deliver demons cast demons out of people and so just observation he had to look at jesus and he had to say all right i see that you have to be somebody who's under authority in other words what you're doing has to come that authority has to come from some place and so he kind of recognized that and it, yeah, I mean, he probably, it, it, I'm not sure he had a real clear understanding of who Jesus was at that particular no, scripture. It doesn't really indicate. But I, based on his observation from what he saw, he came to that conclusion that Jesus, when he said that you must be a man under authority, as I'm a man under authority. So he came, he came to that conclusion, maybe not realizing just the amount of authority that Jesus really had. And so we're going to, we're going to get into some of those scriptures now. And let me go ahead and highlight that. See if I can bring this up. 
and tell me if that's clear to you. Yes, it is. Verse 19. Yeah, okay. So we're going to talk about Ephesians 1. Um, you know, one of my favorite chapters of the whole Bible is Ephesians 1. And um, here he's talking about Jesus, talking about his power, the anointing, the authority that he has. And so it's Ephesians 1.19 says, It is this same might and resurrection power that he, and he's referring to God in this verse, mm -hmm. okay, that he, meaning God, used in the anointed one. And when you see the anointed one you're used in this version, it means Jesus. So it is the same might and resurrection power that God used in Jesus to raise Jesus from the dead and to position him at the right hand, at his right hand in heaven. So now here's here we're going to look at, at what was granted to him in that position. There is nothing over him. He's above all rule. He's above all authority. He's above all power over all dominion, and over every name involved, over every title bestowed in this age, and the one to come. And so when Jesus went to the cross and sacrificed, gave himself, he said, no, no man can take this life from me, but I lay it down willingly. And so he gave his life on the cross and shed his blood and the Bible says that he, when he died, he descended into hell. He made proclamation. At, at, at that particular juncture, I believe, is when God bestowed full authority into his son, Jesus. Because you know, up you know, at, Go ahead. You know, it's kind of ludicrous when you think about it, when you think of Jesus' early life, when Satan, you know, tempts him, when he's takes into the wilderness and he says, you know, if you do these things, you know, I will give you mm -hmm. what Satan was offering him was it's like taking a child or, or let's use an adult. I'll give you a piece of cake. Part of this cheesecake. If you just enjoy this meal with me. And if you're the one who made the meal and you made the cake, well, you already own it. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's ludicrous when you think what Satan offered Jesus when Jesus here has everything. Right. The, the interesting thing about that story is that Jesus always referred back to God or he referred always. back to it is written, you know, but it, it, he didn't. He didn't really take any authority upon himself. He, you know, he said, matter of fact, the Bible says that he emptied himself of all authority. And so everything that he did, he did it in obedience to his father, God. Actually, and so Roger, just like you and I, he was he set aside his humanity to become a man. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. He did. Yes, he did. I mean, yeah, it's amazing. And so, and so this Roman centurion is looking at Jesus, and he's so he's not assigning Jesus himself with that authority, but he recognizes that Jesus is under that authority. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that's how as a man, as a man, that's how he's able to do these miracles and and power. And so but at, at the cross, and then Jesus goes down into hell, he makes proclamation, and he's been given the keys to hell, and he releases the captives. And so there, we see at this particular juncture, there's this transfer of power that occurs. And so, it, so as we just read, as it says in Ephesians 1, so God has given him, using the same power and resurrection power that he used to raise him from the dead, that's the same power that he put in him to get, make him, gave him the authority over everything. When Jesus went up after his earthly ministry and he went up to heaven, Jesus himself said, I have been given all authority in heaven and earth. That's right. He did. 
Right. And so we see a transfer of power that shifts from God to Jesus. And we're going to go on and we're going to look at verse 22 here. And it says, and God has placed all things beneath his feet and appointed him as the head over all things for his church. The church is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all in all. So we see now, okay, so God has transferred all of this power and all this authority to Jesus, but we're his church, we're his body. And so in a sense, it flows downhill from the head. And we're going to look at the next verse. Colossians 2.19 says, holding fast at the head, which is Jesus, from whom all the body nourished and fit together by joints, ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. So we see that there's this progression that has happened. God has grant, given the authority to Jesus. Jesus still retains that authority. He never gives up his authority, by the way. And he never gives it away. And you may hear people actually teach that, but that's that, yeah, that's he not doesn't. biblical. No. He never gives his authority away. But what he does is he allows us to operate through that authority the same way that he operated through the authority that God gave him when he was in his earthly ministry of walk here on earth. And so we're going to now the next verse here, where we have. OK, we could get through it. Um, the next verse here. And this kind of explains how this is going to work, works through us. OK, John 15, 4 says, if you abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you. Unless you abide in me, for apart from me, you could do nothing. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. So we see here that in, for, in order for that authority to flow downhill, that it has to come through this relationship that we have through Jesus Christ. And that authority only comes through our abiding with him because he says, without me, you can't do it. You can't do anything. So only through me and only being connected to me as part of the branch will you be able to do the same works that he was, was able to do. And that's why he says at the end, you'll ask whatever you want and it shall be done. Why? Mm -hmm. Why? It's because it's Jesus doing it through you. And if Jesus is the one doing it, you know what's going to happen. I, I believe, Roger, it comes down to as we as believers in our last uh, two minutes that we have here that we go back up, you know, go up to verse uh, where it talks about all dominion that Jesus had. Scroll back yeah. up to that verse, can you? Yeah, right there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that it has to do, do we re as believers really believe that Jesus has that kind of authority, that kind of power, that kind of dominion, that when we invoke his name, that we can believe that that authority can work through us. In other words, does Jesus really mean what he says? If he really means what he says, and we are abiding in him, that word abide means you're putting your trust in him, uh, you're looking to him for direction. You're not depending upon yourself. There's an attitude of humility that it's God working through me and in me to bring forth his purpose in this person, in our circumstances, in our culture, in our government. Because we, by ourselves, were nothing. But through God, we can do anything, everything. He gives us yes. that ability. And that's why we begin to have to really begin to really comprehend the authority that Jesus has. Because without that revelation of authority, you can be speaking to that tree all day, die. And it's not going to die, okay? You can speak and say, okay, uh, whatever it is, be healed. And if you don't have that relationship with Christ, 
It's not going to happen. It just becomes empty words. But words based on scripture with the understanding of who you are in Christ, related to him correctly, knowing his authority that it can work through you and that his word is powerful, that when you speak it, now it will manifest. And we are out of time. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, but yes, but I I just really almost feel like in the next um, show, Roger, we almost need to pick up this issue of authority again. uh, Because that's good because it's so needed. So I'm going to pray for you guys and pray for revelation. Uh, If you don't know Jesus, you need to receive him. Just follow me. But if you already know him, ask the Lord for a revelation of his authority in your life and what it means for you to be under his authority. So, Father God, we just lift up our viewers today. Lord, if there's someone here tonight, today, this afternoon, whenever they're watching it, in the morning, Father, and they watch this, and they don't know you, Lord. They need to know you, Father. Father, let them understand that they need to come into relationship with you. And it just starts by simply saying, I believe in you, Jesus. Please come and live in my life and help me to grow in you and to learn about you and what it means to be rightly related to you and be under your authority yes. because you are Lord father and father for the other viewers who are watching Lord father, this what topic, what we're talking about is absolutely so huge father. Uh, and there's been so much abuse put over it. Uh, mm-hmm. Father through uh, the church, through uh, even the world Lord and mockery and all these different things, Father. So, Father God, I'm asking that you would give the viewers revelation of your authority, your authority in the earth, your authority in their life. And, Father, we just give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. God is extremely passionate for... You are.